Okay, so let's say we have a loop of wire and we're treating this as a loop of wire in a horizontal plane. Uh, so we've got like an X axis, a Y axis, and then let's say a Z axis going vertically. So we've got a loop of wire and let's say we have a magnetic field in this region. A magnetic field, let's say going uh, straight up. Well, let's say it's just the same amount of magnetic field everywhere. Would you say that this magnetic field is passing through the interior of the loop? Yes. Yeah, certainly looks like it just based on the diagram. We've got the loop, we've got magnetic field. Some of the magnetic field is passing through the interior. And then we just label that B magnetic field. Uh, and then this loop of wire. So definitely at least some of these magnetic field lines are piercing through the interior of the loop. And we call that the, the, the extent to which the magnetic field is piercing through the loop of wire, we call the flux. So we're gonna define flux, specifically magnetic flux, as the extent to which the magnetic field lines are piercing through the interior of the wire. And we can actually define this mathematically. Uh, we usually call this uh, capital phi, the Greek letter phi is a capital letter. And what aspects of the situation mathematically determine how many of the field lines are passing through the interior? Or what could we change about the situation that would modify how many field lines are passing through the interior? It could be the, the area, the surface area. So if you mm -hmm. shrink the area, you have smaller uh, number, you have a smaller number of magnetic field lines passing through it. Exactly. If we made a smaller loop, then it has fewer field lines passing through it. So the area definitely matters. And it should be a direct proportionality. The larger the area is, the more field lines there are passing through it. So it definitely depends on area. And what else could we modify about the situation? Other than changing the size of the loop, what else could change here that would modify how many field lines are passing through? For instance, what if we just put in more field lines? What would that represent if the field lines are packed closer together? Right. The density of the field lines, how closely packed they are, is really just a visual representation for a stronger magnetic field. So if the magnetic field is stronger, then on the drawing, you'd have more field lines passing through. Whereas if the magnetic field is weaker, you'd have field lines drawn more far apart, spread out. And so you'd have fewer field lines passing through. And that's I mean, the density of the field lines is really just a visual representation of the strength of the magnetic field. But this does influence flux. Flux is dependent on how strong the magnetic field is as well. So magnetic, the magnetic flux is area times how strong the magnetic field is. And there's one other thing also. Uh, the idea is if we have this loop of wire, in this case, held in this orientation with the magnetic field straight up, the magnetic fields we would say are piercing through very strongly. But suppose we modify the magnetic field Let's say instead of magnetic field being straight up, let's say the magnetic field is on some diagonal. Actually, let's not even say diagonal. Let's say it's horizontal. If the magnetic field lines are horizontal, would you say these magnetic field lines are passing through the interior of the loop? Not really, no. They're skimming along the surface, but they're not going through. So in this case, if the magnetic field lines are parallel to the surface, in, and the, that is the surface interior to the loop. Like if you think of the surface inside the loop as like, uh, like if you imagine dipping the loop of wire in soap bubble film, the soap bubble film that clings to the inside of the loop of wire, that's the surface we're talking about. Uh, but in general, if you've got uh, magnetic field lines just skimming across the surface, that's not going through the interior. So that doesn't count as flux.
And if you've got field lines going through perpendicular to the surface, that's a lot of flux. But you can also have on some diagonal, let's say you've got magnetic field lines that are on a diagonal like this. In that case, they are certainly passing through the loop, but they're passing through, I guess you might say more weakly than they would be if they were directly perpendicular to the surface. So there is an element of angle here. The angle does play a role. And the way we usually measure that uh, is by drawing out what we call a normal line. And this is the same idea as the, the normal line we were dealing with in, uh, in optics with refraction. The normal line just means a line perpendicular to the surface itself. So here's a normal line, a line perpendicular to the surface. And when, instead of measuring the angle between the magnetic field and the surface, we measure the angle between the magnetic field and the normal line at that location. And the reason for that is mathematically, it turns out to be very inconvenient to try and measure the angle between a vector and a surface. Like for instance, if you want to measure the angle between a vector and a surface, it's kind of difficult to say, do you mean this angle or this angle or this angle or this angle? There's many different ways you could draw that angle. But it, mathematically, it's very easy to create a perpendicular to a surface, and it's very easy to calculate the angle between a vector and a line. So this is the angle we're going to talk about. We usually call this angle theta. So with that angle, uh, that angle is going to play a major role in determining how much flux we're talking about. And how does that influence it? What, th what theta value would lead to the largest possible flux? Like if you could modify this magnetic field to get the most flux possible, what angle would the magnetic field make with the normal line? Yeah, it should be zero. If we have a magnetic field pointing straight up, magnetic field perpendicular to the surface is going to lead to the largest possible flux because it's going straight through. But that magnetic field perpendicular to the surface makes an angle of zero degrees with the normal one. So you actually get the largest amount of flux when theta is zero degrees. Theta being zero degrees means magnetic field is perpendicular to the surface because it's parallel to the normal line. Uh, whereas what angle would lead to the lowest possible amount of flux? Yeah, if theta is exactly 90. If theta is 90, let's say you take your magnetic field and you bend the angle until it is perpendicular to the normal line. If you've got a magnetic field perpendicular to the normal line, then it's just skimming along the surface. And skimming along the surface means it's not going through. So that would be no flux at all. So there is no flux when theta is 90 degrees. That is when B is parallel to the surface perpendicular to the normal line. And then you could have anywhere in between as well, of course. If theta is uh, somewhere between 0 and 90, you would get some flux, but not as much flux as you'd get if it was 0 degrees. And what trigonometric function follows this pattern? What trigonometric function is large when the angle is 0 and 0 when the angle is a right angle? Yeah, cosine works perfectly here. Cosine of 0 is 1, which is large as it can be. Cosine of a right angle is zero, which is no flux at all. So we include a cosine factor here also, times cosine of theta. And this is generally how we define magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is area of the wire loop times the strength of the magnetic field, just the magnitude, times cosine of the angle that the magnetic field vector makes with the normal line itself. So that's generally how we're going to be defining flux. Any questions on that definition so far? And if it helps you remember, area times magnetic field times cosine theta can be thought of as ABC. Not that the order matters, 
you can modify the order, but ABC might help you remember. But the important thing is this is what's necessary to make a mathematical description of to what extent are the magnetic field lines going through the interior of the loop. Any other questions on how flux is defined so far? And let's take a look at units of measurement for a moment. What is area usually measured in? What's our typical units of measurement? Yeah, meters squared. Area is measured in meters squared. And have you seen the units for magnetic field yet? Magnetic field is typically measured in Teslas, written as a capital T. So that's the unit of measurement for how strong the magnetic field is. And we can actually see what that means if we take a look at another equation that magnetic field shows up in, specifically the force equation. Uh, what equation have you been using for the strength of the magnetic force on a charged particle, a moving charge? Yeah, force is charge times speed times magnetic field times sine of the angle between the speed and the magnetic field. Sine theta is unitless, so we can ignore that. But if we take a look at the other units of measurement, uh, what's what are force, charge, and speed measured in? Yeah, speed is measured in meters per second. And force is in newtons. And yeah, charge is in coulombs. So that means we've got Newtons equals Coulombs times meters per second times whatever magnetic field is measured in, and we call that Tesla's capital T. So Newtons has to equal Coulombs times meters per second times Tesla's. And if you solve that for T, what would you get? Or how would you isolate T there? Algebraically, how would you get T by itself? Or if you solve for T, what would you end up with? Yeah, we're gonna have to divide by coulombs. And, and yes, we are dividing by meters per second, but note that that's a fraction. Dividing by meters per second is the same as multiplying by what? Yeah, the inverse, seconds over meters. So we've got Newtons, we're multiplying by seconds and we're dividing by coulombs and meters. So you could think of Tesla's as being equivalent to Newton seconds over coulomb meters. This is what Tesla's means here. Tesla's as a unit is just an abbreviation for Newtons times seconds divided by coulombs times meters. It's just inconvenient to write that out every time. So we just abbreviate it as Tesla's. So magnetic field strength, the magnitude of the magnetic field is measured in Tesla's, which means Newton seconds per coulomb meter. Any questions on that so far? And if I remember correctly, one Tesla is actually a remarkably strong amount of magnetic field. The typical magnets we'd be dealing with in everyday life are much smaller than one Tesla. I'm not sure how much smaller, but I'm pretty sure it's much smaller. Uh, if we go back to the equation for magnetic flux, though, we've got meters squared from the area times Tesla's for the magnetic field. If we actually fill in the formula for Tesla's, we've got meters squared times Newtons times seconds divided by coulombs times meters. If we simplify that, what's going to happen? Can anything cancel out there? Yeah, one of the meters cancels out, 
So we're left with Newtons times one meter times seconds divided by coulombs. And if you think back to 7a, what is Newtons times meters? What is a force times a distance? What do you get if you multiply force times distance? What are you calculating there? That is, if you've got a moving object and you apply a force to it, what are you doing? Yeah, that counts as work. Force times distance is work, which means if you multiply the units, Newton's times meters should equal what units is work measured in? It's a transfer of energy. So that has to be measured in, yeah, Newton's times meters is joules. So we end up with joules times seconds over coulombs. And if we rearrange that a little further, let's say we have joules over coulombs times seconds. If you think back to 7b, when we were dealing with circuits, what is joules over coulombs? That is energy per unit of charge. Or even more recently with the electric field stuff, what do we call the energy density? It'd be joules per coulomb, the energy per unit of charge. With the electric field stuff, what were we defining as potential energy over charge? Exactly, that is voltage. Which means the units, joules over coulombs, that's the units of energy divided by the units of charge is volts. So overall, the units of measurement for flux, Tesla's times meters squared, ultimately works out to volts times seconds. So it's very closely related to voltage. It is not quite voltage, it's volts times seconds. So what would we have to do to this to turn it into voltage? How would you be able to cancel out seconds? Right, we'd have to divide this by time. So that means the change in flux divided by the change in time, the rate of change. Change in flux over change in time is a voltage because when you take the change in flux in volt seconds and divide by time in seconds, seconds cancel out, so you're left with the voltage. And it turns out that what this means is flux alone doesn't really do anything. If there's just the presence of magnetic flux, that doesn't matter. But if the flux is changing as time passes, that changing flux causes extra voltage in the loop of wire. And the faster the flux is changing, the more volts you get. So for instance, if the flux is changing by, let's say five Tesla meters squared per second, you get a voltage of five extra volts because you got five volt seconds per second. Seconds cancel out, that'll be five volts. So this loop of wire would act like it has an invisible five volt battery while the voltage is in the process of changing or whatever strength it is. But in general, while the, while the flux is in the process of changing, not the voltage, while the flux is in the process of changing, the loop acts like there's a tiny invisible battery providing a voltage equal to how fast the flux is changing. As soon as the flux stops changing, that voltage stops though. And we call this induced voltage. Specifically, we, we have delta V induced equals and we usually write this as negative delta flux over delta time. The negative here ultimately refers to direction. Somebody was mentioning earlier the idea of pushing back against the change that the flux, uh, the, the effect, the induced effect resists the changing flux. What this means is the amount of extra voltage you get equals how fast the flux is changing. The negative sign is referring to direction and just tells you that the 
voltage, the induced effect is going to act in a direction opposing the changing flux. Any questions on the theory behind that so far? So let's try out an example to see how this actually works. Let me clear out some of the diagram here. Not the whole thing. I think the makers of Zoom could have hired somebody who knows how to design a graphic arts program. Okay, good enough. So let's say we have a magnetic field in this region. And for simplicity, let's assume it's, uh, let's say straight down. So we have a magnetic field that is perpendicular to the loop of wire or perpendicular to the surface, and it is straight down. Which means what's theta going to be? Yeah, should be zero. Um, by the way, there are a couple of different ways you could draw the normal line because normal line just means a line perpendicular to the surface. We could draw in the normal line or you, you could even think of it as a normal vector. The normal vector could be drawn straight up or straight down. If we draw the normal vector straight up, now what's the angle between the normal vector and the magnetic field? Yeah, 180 degrees. If we do that though, what's cosine of 180 degrees? Yeah, cosine of 180 degrees would be negative one, which means we'd get a very large amount of flux, but it would be a negative amount of flux. So a large negative. Mathematically, this works perfectly well. We still get the same overall results. But having a negative value for flux can make it very difficult to determine directions because you have to think, well, it's negative, but getting bigger. Does that technically count as an increase or a decrease? And that can get very confusing. So generally, I would recommend, you, you always have a choice of two possible directions for normal vector, in this case, up or down. I would generally recommend choosing the normal vector that most closely aligns with the existing magnetic field. So in this case, let's say a downwards normal vector. That way, now what's the angle between the normal vector and the magnetic field? If they're in exactly the same direction, what's the angle between them? Yeah, zero degrees and cosine of zero degrees is one leading to a large positive flux. So whether flux is positive, depend, positive or negative depends on which direction of normal vector you choose. I would just recommend always uh, always choose the normal vector that makes the magnetic that makes the flux positive. That is the normal vector that most closely aligns with the existing magnetic field, just to make it easier to figure out increases and decreases. So we've got a magnetic field, we've got an area, we've got cosine of zero, so we don't even need to worry about that. Flux is just a times b times one. And let's say that we modify this by having the magnetic field get stronger as time passes. Maybe this magnetic field is caused by current in some other wire and we're uh, providing more and more power to that wire getting more and more current. Or maybe this is just in the presence of a permanent magnet and we're moving the permanent magnet closer to make a stronger and stronger magnetic field. Somehow we're making the magnetic field stronger by modifying the source. We don't really need to specify how we're modifying it, just that it is getting stronger. In that case, getting stronger means what's happening to flux. 
if we're keeping the area the same, keeping cosine of zero the same. And yeah, if we make the magnetic field stronger, the flux is going to change in an increasing way. The flux is increasing. If the flux is increasing, first of all, that's flux changing as time passes. And if the flux changes as, as time passes, what does that create? Yeah, I would say it specifically creates induced voltage, but voltage causes current to flow uh, using the Ohm's law idea from, uh, from back in 7B, delta V equals negative I times R. So the increasing flux or, or any change in flux is gonna cause induced voltage to occur. And that voltage creates current flow or pushes current to flow around the loop of wire. And we would call that the induced current. So flux is increasing which creates induced voltage, which pushes current around the loop. And as I mentioned earlier, that current only lasts while the magnetic flux is in the process of changing. If you stop making the magnetic field get stronger, if the magnetic field becomes constant, there's no more change in flux and therefore no more voltage. But while the magnetic field is in the process of getting stronger, Flux is increasing. And let's see if we can use that to determine the direction current will flow. <clears throat> if the flux is increasing, technically flux is a scalar. It doesn't really have a direction. But it's often useful to think of the flux as being in the direction of the normal vector. So if we think of the flux as being a downwards quantity and the flux is increasing, that change is in which direction? If you've got a flux that we're treating as a downwards quantity and it's increasing, getting more and more and more in that direction, what's the direction of change? Yeah, a downwards vector that gets stronger and stronger and stronger, that's a change in the downwards direction. So we could, we could think of this as delta flux is a downwards direction. Again, flux is technically directionless, it's a scalar, but we can think of it as being in the direction of the normal vector for these purposes. So if the normal vector is downwards, then an increase in flux counts as a downwards change. So we can say delta flux is in the downwards direction, but what does this negative sign signify? What does a negative mean in terms of direction? That is, if you have a vector in some direction and you apply a negative, yeah, exactly. A negative sign means in the opposite direction. So all this negative sign is saying is the final result, the induced effect is gonna be in a direction opposite to the change in flux. If you think of the change in flux as a downwards direction, the induced effect should be upwards. So we should think of the induced effect as an upwards tendency. And we can actually use the right hand rule here because upwards doesn't on its own signify anything about the loop of wire. We should expect current flowing either counterclockwise or clockwise within the wire. But we can use the idea of the right hand rule here. Upwards signifies ultimately the direction of the magnetic field created by the flow of current, current in the wire. So if you use the right hand rule, upwards is the induced effect. If you point your thumb upwards, the curl of your fingers tells you the direction current will actually flow. So upwards induced effect really means current flowing looks like that's counterclockwise when viewed from above. So we would say current is flowing in the counterclockwise direction. This is the induced current. So that would be I, the induced current. And the actual strength of that current, how fast current is flowing is gonna be delta V over R, 
where delta V, the induced voltage, is how fast the flux is changing. So these are all quantities you can calculate. If you know how much the flux changes and how much time it takes, you can divide those to find the rate of change, which is the induced voltage. And then if you take that induced voltage and divide by resistance of the whole loop, you get the current. But the direction is determined by the right-hand rule here. A downwards change in flux corresponds to an opposite, an upwards induced effect. And an upwards induced effect means current flowing in this direction around the loop. In this case, we describe that as counterclockwise when viewed from above. Or you could say clockwise when viewed from below. Depends on your point of view. Any questions on that directionality so far? And one other useful thing to look at as a final check to make sure everything fits together. We now have current flowing in a loop. Anytime you've got current flowing in a loop, what does that current create? Or really anytime you've got current flowing at all. The flow of current, the motion of charge, right, it creates its own magnetic field. And in general, if you've got current flowing in a loop, a very useful shortcut for finding the magnetic field, a variation on the right-hand rule, is you can curl your fingers in the direction current is flowing around the loop. Anytime you've got a loop, curl your fingers in the direction current is flowing in the loop, and your thumb tells you the direction of the magnetic field inside that loop. So curl your fingers in the direction of current. Your thumb is now pointing upwards. So within the loop, we have a strong upwards magnetic field. That is the magnetic field that the current in the loop creates. So we would call this the induced magnetic field. That is the magnetic field created by that induced current. And how does the direction of that magnetic field compare to everything else we've seen so far? Specifically, how does it compare to the original change? What was the change that created this in the first place? Yeah, we were changing the density, the strength of the magnetic field. And specifically, that change was in which direction? We had a downwards magnetic field. We were making it stronger or weaker? Yeah. If you've got a downwards magnetic field and you're making it stronger and stronger and stronger, you would say the change is in which direction? If you're making it stronger and stronger in the downwards direction? Yeah, if your initial vector is downwards and you change it to make it an even stronger vector downwards, from initial to final. The change is downwards because you've gone from a little bit downwards to a lot downwards. So the change from here to here is downwards. So we've got a downwards change that's creating the induced effect, but the final induced magnetic field is upwards, which is opposite to the change. That's ultimately what we should, what we should be looking for here. As you, if you want a final check to make sure your answer makes sense, figure out the induced magnetic field caused by the flow of current in the loop. The final induced magnetic field should be in a direction opposite to the change that created it. Not necessarily opposite to the original magnetic field, but opposite to the change that created the, the induced effect. So that's ultimately what this negative sign is talking about. The negative sign means the final induced magnetic field is gonna be in a direction opposite to the change that created this effect in the first place. Any other questions on that so far? <clears throat> then let me modify this a little bit. Let's back up and say, suppose we had the same original setup, a loop of wire, magnetic field pointing downwards. But let's say instead of the magnetic field getting stronger, Let's say the magnetic field gets weaker as time passes. If the magnetic field is getting weaker, then what happens to flux? 
if we're making B get weaker and weaker, what would happen to the flux? Right, the flux would get smaller. The flux is decreasing. And let's be very careful about the direction there. If the flux is decreasing, and remember, we can think of uh, we can think of flux as being in the direction of the normal vector. So you can think of flux as being downwards. But if you've got a downwards vector and it's decreasing, getting smaller and smaller, that changes in which direction? If you've got a downwards vector and it gets weaker and weaker and weaker, which direction is the change? Yeah, the change is upwards. Because if you've got a large downwards vector and it gets weaker, the change is in the upwards direction. And you could even th see this with final minus initial. A small downwards vector minus a large downwards vector is an upwards difference. So the change is upwards. We can say delta flux is upwards. So the induced effect should be opposite to that. In other words, downwards. The induced effect is down here. So a downwards vector that's getting weaker, or a downwards, flu downwards flux that's getting weaker is an upwards change. So the induced effect should be opposite to that. That means a downwards induced effect. And here we can use the right hand rule again. A downwards induced effect means you be pointing your thumb downwards. The curl of your fingers would now be clockwise when viewed from above. So we would now have uh, within this loop of wire, we would get current flowing in the clockwise when viewed from above direction. So something like this. So that would be the induced current. And again, if you use the right hand rule to determine the final induced magnetic field, curl your fingers in the direction current is flowing, thumb is pointing downwards. So the final induced magnetic field is in the downwards direction. And note that that is opposite to the direction of change. Because we had a downwards original magnetic field that's getting weaker, that's an upwards change. The induced effect is downwards and that's opposite to the original change that created it. Any other questions on direction so far? <clears throat> then let's try out another type of change we could look at. Let me clear some of this. So I think we should be able to reuse a lot of this. Let's say instead of, uh, let's say we still have this downwards magnetic field, but instead of changing the strength of the magnetic field, let's keep the same magnetic field, but instead shrink the wire. Let's say we, we keep the same magnetic field, but the loop of wire has gotten smaller. Maybe we've got a, a flexible wire and we it's maybe it's stretched out and we allow it to contract again. So if the wire loop gets smaller, what does that do to flux? If we're keeping the same magnetic field, same angle, but shrinking the area. Yeah, flux is getting smaller. So it looks like that's gonna be the same sort of effect as weakening the magnetic field. We've got flux decreasing because the loop is getting smaller. Decreasing flux, that's also gonna create induced voltage which pushes current around the loop of wire. But in this case, we've got a downwards flux. Again, we can think of flux as being in the direction of the normal vector, even though flux is technically a scalar. <clears throat> 
And so if you think of flux as downwards, but it's getting weaker and weaker and weaker, that's a change in which direction. Downwards vector getting weaker, which direction is the change? Yeah, the change is in the upwards direction. So we'd say that the delta flux is in the upwards direction here. So what does that tell you about the induced effect? Yeah, once again, the negative sign means the induced effect is opposite to the change in flux that caused it. So an, uh, down, an upwards change in flux should correspond to or create a downwards induced effect. And again, we can use the right hand rule for that. Point your thumb in the downwards direction. The curl of your fingers tells you the direction of the induced current. So that'll be clockwise when viewed from above. So again, that's going to be magnetic or sorry, induced current flowing in this sort of direction. So that would be the direction of the induced current in this now smaller loop of wire. And again, that only happens while it's in the process of changing. As soon as the loop stops changing size, there's no more change in flux and therefore no further induced voltage and the current stops flowing. It only flows while the flux is in the process of changing. Any other questions on that? Or any other questions on flux and induced current in general? And by the way, so far we've talked about what happens if you change how strong the magnetic field is and what happens if you change how big the loop of wire is. What's the one other thing that could be changing that would modify flux? Yeah, the angle itself. And that could be like, let's say you keep the loop of wire in place, but you change the angle of the magnetic field. Or if you keep the magnetic field in a constant direction, but tilt the loop around. Either one of those would count as a changing angle, and that could change the flux and therefore cause induced current to flow. So that's another thing to watch for. Look for, is the angle changing? Is the magnetic field changing? Is the area changing? Any of those things changing could change the flux. It's also possible that it doesn't change the flux at all. For instance, let's say you've got a loop of wire, magnetic field just passing by, so that'd be no flux. If you change the strength of the magnetic field, it's still just passing by, not going through. So that wouldn't actually change the flux. Zero is still zero. So keep in mind that it only, you only get a change in flux and therefore an induced voltage if something is actually causing the flux to change. If it starts at zero and stays zero, that's no change. You've got to have some actual change. Any other questions on that so far? All right, see if you can apply this to some of the practice problems on either the FNTs or the practice quizzes. Let me know if you have any other questions later on, and we can try out some more examples next time. You're welcome. See you later.